Thank you everybody for coming out tonight. We're going to take a little whirlwind trip from the coast to the mountains. And we're going to take a journey that will also include a dip over the border into North Carolina and Tennessee, not just Virginia. My latest book is called Haunted Highlands, Ghosts and Legends of North Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia. And when I started working on this particular project, as, as a lot of books go, is people would say, hey, do you have a story on this? And hey, do you have a story on that? And I started realizing that if I had this story and that story and this story and that story, I would eventually have another book. And I went off on this journey out to the Major Graham's Mansion, which is what's on the cover. And we were trying to figure out a way to get uh, a great design. And I was able to work with my publisher and I said, you know what I want is to have the letters Haunted Highlands written in bones. And they said, well, what kind of font is that? And I said, I'm not sure if you can find a font on your computer that's written in bones. So I said, look at the first Leonard Skinner record in 1973, and it was written in bones, Leonard Skinner. So that's what we were going after. And we also have the blood on the bones. The Major Graham's mansion that is on the cover is a real place. And it is located in Wythe County, Virginia, up in an area called Graham's Forge. Framed with a handsome brick facade, the Major Graham Mansion near Graham's Forge rises along an isolated gravel road looking like a haunted house in a nightmare. It is too said to be haunted. One tale says slaves killed their master here in the 1700s. More stories circulate of the wealthy Graham family ruling slaves in an industrial empire that once stretched across the mountains of Wythe County, Virginia during the 1800s. This landmark dates to the 1840s. It was the home to an eccentric book collector. He would let chainsaws and cardboard boxes just pile up in his living room. He had no electricity, he had no water. Many years after that, J.C. Weaver, a rancher and a musician, restored the building and opened it for tours as a haunted house and historical attraction. Along the way, Visitors like Dorothy Burgundy have walked away with strange photographs of the mansion showing mysterious shadows that appeared to be human yet ghostly. And more than one encounter as well has been reported with the Shadow Man. Now the Shadow Man is an unexplained figure who showed up late one night about three o'clock in the morning in July 2004, 13 years ago, Troy Black and some friends spotted it on a gravel road outside the mansion. There, Mr. Black found himself face to shadow for about 15 seconds with this gray colored figure. He said it had wide eyes and no visible pupils. It was a powerful looking thing and it was standing about 15 feet away from me. Everybody else had run and I just stood there. I had never seen anything like it before. He said it was massively built. It didn't look like he was naked, but I didn't see that he looked like he was wearing any clothes. The Haunted Highlands is a region that I combined of Southwest Virginia, where you see to Radford over to Pound and Bristol, Castlewood, Saltville, Abingdon, Withville, down into Northeast Tennessee, uh, Johnson City, Kingsport, Bristol, Greenville, Tennessee, and out into the high country of North Carolina, which a lot of people have come to know more as a ski slope area, out in the Boone and Blowing Rock and Banner Elk and Beach Mountain. Just about every town starts with a B in that area. Over in Kingsport, this is a mansion called Rotherwood, or Rotherwood II more properly. And this is the water from several counties in Southwest Virginia will drain down from Bland County, Smith County, Washington County, Scott, parts of Russell. They all come down this little area known as the North Fork of the Holston River. And when they go past this area, any boater that goes past this area for 100 years have seen a lady in a wedding dress who is allegedly still waiting for her husband-to-be 
to come down. He was on a boat that it capsized and she's still waiting for her life and the afterlife that she never got here. Out in North Carolina, there's a long list of legends about the Brown Mountain Lights. People have talked about the Brown Mountain Lights really for a couple of centuries. When the sun disappears, the lights come on, mysteriously rising above the base of Brown Mountain. No one seems to know what causes this a few miles east of Linville, North Carolina. But these weird and wavering lights climb above Brown Mountain and gradually fade. Native American mythology mentions this phenomenon, and so do early scientists exploring the mountains as early as the 1700s. The Brown Mountain lights can alternately appear glowing as balls and sometimes changing colors, and sometimes they simply look pale. Scientists have, have, have attempted to explain the sights of the lights in Burke County. There was a U.S. Geological Survey in 1913. They blamed these lights on a locomotive's headlights. It's the train, they said, that you're seeing the train. And then you know what happened? Well, a flood came in, washed out the railroad, cut off the electricity, and still the brown mountain lights appeared. Another scientific theory said this was marsh gas that caused the lights, despite a lack of marshy areas around Brown Mountain. Even more explanations blame radium ore deposits and unstable air currents refracting our bending light rays. A first-hand study in the 1960s found the lights flashing out of crevices on the mountains and causing some observers to have a static-like feeling of dizziness. One legend says the lights represent the ghost of a heartbroken woman using a torch to look for her lost fiance. Another says these are lights used by a father forever looking for his lost little girl. And even one more story says a planter got lost and his slave came looking for him night after night after night with a lantern. And now the illumination of the slave's lantern remains casting its light over the dark mountain. In Mount Airy, North Carolina, the gentleman who's buried, very beloved gentleman in America, Andy Griffith, is buried down on Roanoke Island, North Carolina. But he came from Mount Airy, North Carolina. And when you watch the Andy Griffith show, a lot of what you're seeing are, is a blend of the experiences that he had when he was uh, a young man performing at the Lost Colony in Manio. Once in an interview, he said that a lot of what he talked about on Mayberry and a lot of the influencers for the show stories came from Manio. And yet, if you go to Mount Airy, you'll also find that a lot of the places are very similar to what you see on the screen. But here we have this place, a wine glass held up by a skeleton. That was never on one of the plots of the Andy Griffith show. So what's going on there? This is a place that I had found a few years ago and wrote a magazine article about. You see, nobody knows where this skeletal arm came from or to who it even once belonged. But this lost limb showed up years ago inside a cellar wall with a century-old structure in Mount Airy. And that arm at 300 North Main Street has since been blamed for sightings of ghostly happenings at what became the old North State Winery. In the wee hours of the morning, the winery cellar staff members hear walking on hardwood floors. They hear <laughs> shuffling feet and the sound of a slamming door. Some see shadows shift across walls. Some have reported a phantom piano plan. In the words of the winery's co-owner, Ellie Webb, it always feels like you're not alone in this building. You can be totally by yourself, and it feels like there's somebody, people here with you. The old North State Winery stands prominently in Mount Airy, the hometown of the late actor Andy Griffith. And today they've not only put this arm on the Restless Soul Winery, the Restless Soul Red Table Wine at the winery, but they've also decided to have a little fun with the skeleton. They've also created another one called Bare Bones. And Bare Bones has a skeleton, and she has a, a, a yellow wig on. So this is the girl version of it. But today they believe this is a ghost that's forever looking for its lost arm. 
Horn in the West is in Boone, North Carolina. It's a beautiful outdoor drama, a lot like The Lost Colony down in Manio. So where The Lost Colony tells the story of the late 1500s, this is telling a story of the late 1700s. Horn in the West is a play that's been staged since the 1950s. It blends a tale of early pioneers confronted by Native Americans with a story of these same pioneers fighting the British during the Revolutionary War. It was originally titled Wilderness Road, became Horn in the West by the time of its premiere in 1952 at the Daniel Boone Amphitheater, where trees were artfully left to carefully grow in the backdrop of the 2,500 seat playhouse carved out of Watauga County's rugged terrain. Every few scenes, you will see the Reverend Isaiah Sims. He was a character who was portrayed by a couple of different actors, one of which is a man who now is believed to be haunting the Horn in the West, Charles Elledge. They believe sometimes that when they stand backstage, they see this figure and then he disappears. They believe that Mr. Elledge is still there. Now that is kind of common. In a lot of theaters, you will hear stories of people who love that theater so much, they love this stage like this so much that they can't get it out of their heads. And when they're gone, their energy comes back and it's back on stage again. But how did Mr. Sims get his name? The funny thing is, he's not a historical person. He was actually a character that was created for Charles Elledge in 1956. And he performed this for three decades. The name actually comes from a Sims Creek along the Blue Ridge Parkway, which shares its name with Hamp Sims. Mr. Hamp Sims was a peculiar man who lived near Sims Creek in the early 1900s, and he used to sleep in a coffin. And then he'd go, boom, just to scare visitors. Along the North Carolina-Tennessee border, there is a little place up in Johnson County, Tennessee, and it is known as Stone Mountain. Now, this is not too far from Trade, Tennessee, which is the oldest known settlement in the mountains of Tennessee. And high up on this mountain, there was a man who used to go up there with his fiddle. And his name was Stone Martin Stone. But he was not just any fiddler. His sweet music had said he could make babies stop crying. He could cure people of sickness. He was called on, he played at dances. He played at weddings. He played at funerals. His talent took him everywhere. But you see, it was how he charmed those snakes on Stone Mountain that really made him a legend. The snakes, they would come out of the ground and they'd hear him play They'd start to dance. They'd sway back and forth, back and forth. He'd get all these things, and he was amazed by this the first time he was out there. Wow, look at these creatures. So he went back up there and he had his, he had his fiddle out, and they're swaying, they're going back and forth, and they're listening. And then as he's getting his fiddle, he's looking at them, and he reaches down, and he goes, pow, 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 pow! He shoots them all. Grabs her snake skins. I know, I heard you say no. I, isn't that sad? He grabs her snake skins, puts them in his sack, slithers back down to town, sells them. He goes back up there again with his fiddle, and they're dancing, and they're dancing, pow, pow, pow! Gone again. There he is, going back down the mountain, selling some more snake skins. I'm not going to tell you the end of that story, but I will tell you that the snakes played the final refrain. <laughs> when I was working on my Virginia Rail Trails book, Virginia Rail Trails Crossing the Commonwealth, which uh, is a book that I worked on longer than any, uh, between seven and nine years. I went over to Ash County, North Carolina, and I went into the library. Now, the wonderful thing about Norfolk is that we are the headquarters for this great place of tracks, Norfolk Southern, predecessor of the Norfolk and Western Railway, was one of the railroads that it was before it became Norfolk Southern. 
Now, the Abingdon branch of the Norfolk and Western Railway was not just a Virginia track. It also went more miles. In fact, it was more miles covering in North Carolina. and went right past this cliff here in Warrensville, North Carolina. The Virginia Creeper Trail, which is one of the most popular railroads turned to trails in Virginia, is only on the North Carolina side for half a mile outside of a little town called Lansing, but it's primarily a Virginia trail for 34 miles from the North Carolina border to Abingdon, Virginia. There's only one portion that's been left over as a rail trail down in North Carolina, and then there's Railroad Great Road, which was a roadway. When they were making this trail, to be a train originally, they had a whole lot of dynamite they needed to blast. And when they blasted this place out, it became known as the Devil's Stairs. And all sorts of weird things happened at the Devil's Stairs. Even in bright sunshine, it's dark and gloomy. Faces and sometimes even entire figures like a woman wearing a flowing white gown seemingly appear in the cracks and crevices, the rocks and the shadows of the scenery. Look for the Devil's Stairs above North Carolina 194. It's just above the waters of Buffalo Creek. Here in the 1930s, a mysterious and beautiful lady in white was once seen by a group of men and then suddenly disappeared. Do you see the lady in white? If you look close enough in this photograph, you will see a lady over on the left side. This is her face, this is her gown, this is her angel wings. Here are her feet. You can see that she's sort of smiling there. I didn't know this shadow was like that. I had a friend who pointed this out to me as I was working on this particular book. One time a minister picked up a hitchhiker during a blinding rainstorm. Driving on near the devil's stairs, the minister looked in his rearview mirror several times to observe the hitchhiker in the back seat, but he could never catch sight of the stranger's face. Finally, after several minutes, the minister turned and saw what appeared to be the face of the devil. The stranger's eyes were as red as fire and as big as a fist. That stranger, so frightened, suddenly stopped to let the man out. Only then the preacher found that there was actually no one in the back seat of the car. Virginia Rail Trails is Again, my book that traces old railroads and how they turn to trails. Started working on it in 2005 and it was published in 2014. And one of the stories that I tell about is how Old Maud bowed to the Virginia Creeper. Old Maud is this horse. This is a stone depiction of it at the Green Cove Depot. And this is not too far from the Devil's Stairs really as the crow flies just down the tracks a little bit as well, just a few miles down what would have been the railroad tracks in those days. Green Cove is when you get on your bicycle and you ride from White Top Station, three miles, just, you don't even have to pedal for three miles when you go on down into Green Cove because the, the tracks are like this. You're going up a hill or down the hill. And a lot of people go to Damascus, Virginia these days and they get on the shuttle and then they ride back down. This photograph was taken by O. Winston Link, photographer who has a museum in downtown Roanoke. And he was in Norfolk uh, more than once and shot some photographs over in this area as well, in the Hampton Roads area. And the great thing about, route, about the Virginia Creeper Trail is that it parallels Route 58. Here's a scene from 1949 of Highway 58. And of course, we are just right off of Route 58 here in Norfolk at the MacArthur Memorial. This is in Damascus, Virginia. And as you can see, it says that Route 58 is not recommended for through traffic. And basically it says something different, but basically it says turn around if you have a truck, don't go this way. And, but this is the old railroad line, that is the road, and this is one of the photographs that I used in another recent book called Along Virginia's Route 58, True Tales from Beach to Bluegrass. 
This was a book that I produced because I had my original book, Beach to Bluegrass, go out of print. And when it was released in 2007, it was released as a small coffee table book, and its main focus was on the great stories from one side of Virginia to the other, from Cape Henry to Cumberland Gap. And over the years, after it was the publisher decided that they were going into some other businesses and some people had died out, another lady was retiring, and they said, we're not really keeping all of our books in print. And I said, I guess it is kind of time to start something new. So I wanted a new chapter for the material and look at it again, because I'd actually been collecting photographs thinking I was gonna actually write a book, and it was in my notes already called Along Virginia's Route 58. But the true tales from beach to bluegrass note that you're going from the beach that the Jamestown settlers landed in 1607 to the bluegrass of Kentucky where Daniel Boone went out to the west through the Cumberland Gap at the gateway to the west. But this cover here kind of gives you a good idea of where you're going. Up in the upper right corner is Mabry Mill. To the upper left is the Wilburn Ridge up at the Mount Rogers National Recreation Area. Mabry Mill at the Blue Ridge Parkway. Just below it, uh, below Wilburn Ridge, we have the picture of the boardwalk back in the 1930s or 40s in downtown Virginia Beach. And over to the right is the other downtown Virginia Beach, which is the town center area now. That is when Pembroke Mall was fairly new back in 1972. And just below it, the Mount Rogers Scenic Byway at White Top Mountain. And also out close to where I live today, where Interstate 81 and Route 58 combined to be the same road. Going across from east to west, Route 58 takes on a, every town and terrain you could imagine as it's going along the southern border of Virginia. And it goes on out to the west, going around the mountains uh, through Galax and Martinsville and Patrick Springs, Stewart, and just to go back one, this is a warning. If you go between Lawrenceville and Franklin, or between Franklin and Lawrenceville, you will pass a town that starts with an E near Interstate 95, go at least nine miles below the speed limit there, or you will get a traffic ticket. 72, we can see Pembroke Mall in one of the cover photos. And my daddy had a station wagon, sort of like that one there on the far left. So I might actually be in that particular photo. I was living here at the time. Here's the tunnel, just as it was opening up. So this is the tunnel between Norfolk and Portsmouth. And these are photographs that I got by the good graces of my friends over at the Virginia Department of Transportation. The Midtown Tunnel open on July, you know what? We're just about on a birthday here. We're one day after this, July 11th, 1962. One of the unique things, if you look at this photograph too, that I love about this, one of the photos that I included in the, in the, the new Route 58 book, and when I came out with the second edition, I added about four to 5,000 more words and 90 different photographs. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a little significantly different. Um, you can see the river, the Elizabeth River, but you can also see the railroad that is now uh, the Elizabeth River Trail. Um, and if it didn't have that crossing there, the trail wouldn't have actually been constructed um, as it is today. Here we are out in Brunswick County, your highway taxes at work. Gate City, Virginia. This is the uh, courthouse town of Scott County, Virginia. And here we are going over into Stickleyville in 1971. You can still drive on that today, and yes, you are driving over a patched up thing where the, <laughs> where the road is kind of carved out there in Cade. That's kind of a little scary, uh, but that is what the highway still looks like. And that is going from Scott County into Lee County, Virginia, which is the last county that you will reach. So you're 507 miles going across from Cape Henry to Cumberland Gap, and it's quite a journey. Here we are where it begins. Route 58 starts in the uh, oceanfront district of Virginia Beach um, and connects in with Route 60, which is another legendary highway that, that goes on for miles and many more miles in Route 58, in fact. 
And as it goes across, eventually it comes over here and reaches from US 60, it goes over to US 25E. And this is at the Cumberland Gap. Now the last half mile curves into Tennessee for just a little bit. But you'll stand on these rocks, this is at Cumberland Gap, that is in Virginia, and I'm looking down into the town of Cumberland Gap, Tennessee, on that final stretch of Route 58. One of the unique photos that I found for this was, was something that, you know, we need to know why we don't call it the concrete walk or the paved walk down there at Virginia Beach. It was a board walk with boards on it at one time. And here we are in 1905. Now this is just before the big fire at the Princess Anne uh, the Hotel in, in Virginia Beach. And when that fire hit, this was the Princess Anne Hotel had featured a ballroom and a post office and enough space for 400 people. But just before daybreak on June 18th, 1907, June 10th, excuse me, June 10th, 1907, the hotel caught fire, forcing guests to escape in their pajamas. Tragically, a maid who had helped wake up the guests lost her life in the flames as she stood on a rooftop. Later, when the smoke cleared, the, final ho the finest hotel on the Virginia Beach shoreline was gone. That same fire also consumed much of the original five-block boardwalk. So we replaced it with this, the concrete walk. So call it that from now on. So here's the Cumberland Gap. This is where Cumberland Mountain dips down and, of course, forms a gap. And this was used by 300,000 people to travel west between 1780 and 1810. This was the major gateway to the west in those years. And here we are again, looking out. This is in Virginia, looking down at the Cumberland Gap. And Virginia actually, goes all the way out to this mountain right up here. The great thing about going off and doing a second edition is to go back and revisit all these places. And having been out talking for seven, eight years about that book, and then to go back and say, wow, if you could do it again, what would you do? What would you add? And there were so many different angles and pictures and things that I wanted to get in there. Um, you're looking off into Kentucky, but you kind of get a good view here at the top as to where they walked and how that became a doorway. And you see these mountains. If you didn't have that gap right there, boy, you'd really be doing some mountain climbing to get out to the west. Some of the legendary landmarks that I stopped at with some new photographs is the Riddick's Folly. Mills Riddick, you know, in 1837, he insisted on using bricks to build his new home, rising nearly four stories 16 fireplaces in Suffolk, Virginia, 21 rooms. His mansion became a gargantuan site. The neighbors jokingly called it Riddick's Folly, saying it was a folly to build such a massive Greek revival structure. But it proved perfect for Union Major General John James Peck, who took over Riddick's Folly as a hospital and headquarters for staff of Army officers during the Civil War. You'll pass by the Chrysler Museum and this wonderful statue in downtown Norfolk. And here we come into Fort Norfolk, great old place. Fort Norfolk dates back a couple of hundred years. And you know, one of the wonderful things about it is you can go out and take a beautiful, quiet tour of it today. The thing is, Norfolk not, wasn't and then we've had a habit in downtown Norfolk, and I grew up about two blocks from Norfolk, so I claim Norfolk as well. We've had a habit in downtown Norfolk of kind of tearing down everything and rebuilding it. It's just the way the city's always been. It's just always been the, the, the policy. And it's, it's, it's kind of like starping and starting and starting and stopping and such. And sometimes it's really done well. It's a beautiful city. But naive planners, at one time, they filled in creeks and marshes with old boards from shipwrecks, only to see those boards rot and become a place where mosquitoes flourished. Birds, boats, and crab pot buoys of working watermen still dot the urban river called the Elizabeth. But since World War II, when Mr. MacArthur was in charge, 
About half of its wetlands have been filled or drained, destroying the habitats of oysters, crabs, birds, and fish. Fort Norfolk stayed busy through the War of 1812 when it was used to defend Norfolk's inner harbor. But by 1848, the fort fell into disuse and become the home of a squatter, good old Lemuel Fentrist, who not only moved in, but also billed the War Department $1,500 and said, hey, I took care of the place for you. Since I did the first version of Route 58 in this one, I went over to Portsmouth and found good old Commodore James Barron up on a mural. Commodore James Barron was fired on by the British in 1807, which led to the Embargo Act, which led to the War of 1812. And it's a long story that's full of tragedy, full of humor, it's full of a lot of debate, it led to a duel, and it led to eventually this man's name being honored in Norfolk and Portsmouth. But it's a great story that's also told along the way on Route 58. But you know, it's not the only mural you'll find along the route. And this is a story of greater tragedy. This is in Danville, Virginia. And the thing about it is, if you look at music, country music, some about country music, when you, when you think about it, it's all about love, heartbreak, and train wrecks. The latter actually helped the genre get started. A Danville disaster was turned into a million selling hit by singer Vernon Dalhart. That song also stirred a fierce debate over its copyright. Had it not been for that song, the 1903 crash of the old 97 would have gone down as just another train wreck. Instead, the song elevated to mythic proportions the story of engineer Joseph Andrew Steve Brody's attempts to make up for lost time. It captured the imagination of train enthusiasts. It even inspired the names of some Danville businesses. September 27, 1903, the express mail train number 97 ran nearly an hour behind when, with the delay possibly beginning with a wait for other cars at the Washington, D.C. But it didn't matter where or when, the train would still be fine for not delivering mail on time. So quickly, Mr. Brody climbed aboard engine number 1102 at Monroe, Virginia, and headed train number 97 south towards Spencer, North Carolina. He was a substitute driver, but he had steered some trains on this before. As he got into Danville, the locomotive whistle moaned long and loud, a number 97 derailed, taking a nosedive at 2.42 p.m. The runaway train flew from more than 75 feet and the locomotive landed on its top. Dust clouds rose out of the ravine and look at the, see the mural, canaries fluttered out of cracked cages in a wrecked cargo car all on an otherwise quiet Sunday afternoon. Hundreds raced down the hillside to the horrible scene of the dead and injured, scalded by steam. Mr. Brody, he died as skin was peeling from his body. Before long, songs, poems, all kinds of things started rising out of that ravine, and we had the wreck of the old 97 on the, song, on the store shelves. Trains have always been fascinating to me, and that's one of the reasons I've always ex ex excited about talking about the landmarks on Route 58 and the landmarks associated with the, the rail trails. This is a place that when you talk about ghosts, People also want to talk about legends and other things and maybe some other unexplained things. This is a train depot in South Hill, Virginia that was built in 1924. Today you can go inside there. There's a little space for a doll museum. There's a little model train museum. And if you look very closely on that model train museum, you will also see a little teeny tiny miniature UFO. Now, why is that UFO there on the layout of the Atlantic and Danville Railway? Well, you see, it's been about 50 years since the UFO was spotted in South Hill, Virginia. And this UFO was seen by a man named C.N. Crowder, April 21st, just a few weeks after the town's boundaries were redrawn. The town of South Hill originally was drawn in a circle and then it was expanded beyond that circle. Mr. Crowder said the UFO with 20 foot metal storage tanks and legs about three and a half feet long, high, blasted off with white fire and left a burn spot on the road. Representatives of NASA, 
investigated the incident, so did the media representatives and many curious sightseers. They all came to little conclusion. Perhaps it did actually land there. Just down the road and to the west, Route 58 comes to the great Bugs Island Lake. Bugs Island Lake goes by two different names. Virginians call it Bugs Island because Samuel Bug lived in Virginia. The North Carolinians, North, North Carolinians, they call it Carr Reservoir because John Jose Carr, a North Carolina politician, was able to finally get this thing together and finish it. But we're not gonna call it that because we're from Virginia, so we keep it with the bug guy. It's always gonna be Bugs on and Lake. So that's why you always see it in parentheses. And the river that it's on, two names too. You had the Roanoke River and you had the Stanton River. Now the Stanton River got its name, some say, from Colonel Henry, Captain Henry Stanton. He was a, a, a fire out on the Virginia frontier. And the Roanoke River got its name from an Indian word meaning shell money. The settlers did not know they were on the same river. That's how it ended up with two different names. How do you pronounce Stanton? Is it Stanton or is it Staunton? Stanton. Stanton. I was reminded this at a club that I spoke at this afternoon. And I actually, I never have had a, a problem with it. I've always said Stanton. But a gentleman said that he had been uh, in the car and he said that he had gone for about a half an hour with his girlfriend in the car. And he had gone uh, eventually into Stanton. They were driving around town. They finally got some lunch. They pulled up to the Burger King in Stanton. And he was like, you know what? I'm going to solve this. And he goes up to the drive-in window and he says to the girl, he says, can you tell me very slowly where we are? And she looked at him and she said, Burger King. <laughs> And here it is continued on today. This is Clarksville. That's my little boy, John, dedicated the book to him. Then he helped me write the second edition and, um, and traveled with me, it really. And um, so this is how it's all filled up today. Clarksville's a beautiful town. And originally it was known as Roanoke, Virginia, before there was a Roanoke, Virginia. Buffalo Springs, you can stop there and get some Buffalo Spring water. You're supposed to drink six to eight glasses daily of this stuff. I was actually in West Virginia when I found this bottle and added this to the, to the new version of the book, the Buffalo Mineral Water. Berry Hill out in South Boston. These are some historic photographs. And this is the horseshoe shaped staircase that looks like it's floating. And not only is it floating, there's also the ghostly little boy that's supposed to be running around the Berry Hill plantation. This is in Halifax County. Patrick Henry was out in this area too, and they have a monument to him in Henry County. Patrick Henry is the only man or person who has two counties named for him in Virginia, Patrick County and Henry County, sitting right next to each other. When he came out to the mountains in the 1770s, he was done being the governor. He said, that's it, I wanna retire. I wanna have some nice quiet time. And they said, no, 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 you're Patrick Henry. Give me liberty, give me death, come on, rah, rah, rah. And they start getting him out into another political office. Next thing you know, 1784, he's the governor again. So he's back out of his retirement. He just tried to stay there at the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. He's not the only famous person associated with that great long and winding road called Route 58. As you go into White Top, and this is one of the cover photos, you go into the Mount Rogers Scenic Byway. And this is also the Crooked Road, Virginia's Heritage Music Trail. And as you go along, this is White Top Mountain at the, at the right in the distance. And White Top is crossed by the Appalachian Trail, which is not the Appalachian Trail, it's the Appalachian Trail. And how do I know it's the Appalachian Trail? Don't ever call it Appalachian Trail. I was giving a speech a few years ago up in Clintwood, Virginia, and I didn't make that mistake. I'd already known that it was Appalachian Trail. I don't know, I just sort of picked it up one day. And this lady, she said, I heard how you saying all them names and towns and everything, how they get their names, you know. 
you know how Appalachia got its name, don't you? And I said, well, it was the Spanish came in and they saw the Indian tribe, the Appalachians. She says, oh, no, no, honey, I don't know about all that. No, it was a man and a woman. They was a fighting, you see. And they came up and she got tired, plum tired of him. And she finally said, you better watch out or I'm going to throw an apple at you. So Appalachian Trail goes across White Top Mountain, which was originally known as Meadow Mountain. And Peter Jefferson, when he got out there, he looked at this, Thomas Jefferson's daddy, and they called it Meadow Mountain. He got its name White Top, not because of the snow, and there's a lot of snow. I can see it practically from the house. But you, there is a lot of snow there and in the wintertime, usually from October to April. There's a whole lot of snow up there because it's 5,520 feet high. You can't actually drive on top of it, but it got its name because this field of grass up there looks white at a distance. Eleanor Roosevelt came up there in August of 1933 and 20,000 people came up to see her at the White Top Music Festival. Her father had lived in that area in the 1890s and she wanted to see his old stomping grounds. Not too far down the road, but back over in Patrick County, you will find Fairy Stone State Park. Fairy Stone State Park is one of the original state parks, and it also has a tie back to the 1930s. We have the first landing state park in Virginia Beach, which of course was started as Seashore State Park. We also have Hungry Mother was another one of the original ones. It's out in Marion. So there was actually six all total of their first state parks that we had. Fairy Stone, great, great story. People said that the fairy stones that have little crosses on them, they came from this scientific thing of plates being pushed together and all this kind of stuff. I don't believe a word of that. The story is that long ago the fairies frolicked. They danced beside a spring. And then came news from an elfin messenger that Jesus Christ, the son of the great creator, had been crucified. The fairies cried. They shed tears that turned to fairy stones shaped like St. Andrew's Roman and Maltese crosses. The story is quite literally a fairy tale. But scientists, of course, they dismiss it, saying the fairy stones are usually brown starlight and combination of iron, silica, aluminum, etc., etc., blah, 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 blah. Fairy stones have turned up in only a few places like Fairy Stone State Park in Patrick County. I believe the fairy tale. I think it's a much prettier story and really professes to a true story of love. It's not the only state park that we have along 58. Um, we also have the Wilderness Road Trail State Park, which is the furthest west in all of Virginia, and it is crossed by the Wilderness Road Trail, which was once part of the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. By the time I got out in there into Lee County, I was going back over some material that I had written in my very first book called Southwest Virginia Crossroads. And to make a long story short, when one book ran out of print, my other book went out of print. So I decided it was time to do a second edition of this one as well. So about a year and a half after I got Route 58 back on the road, it was decided it was time to go back to my first book of 100,000 words, 138 pictures, and 39 maps. And I added 20-some photos and updated a lot of the material. So I wanted to give you a slight taste of what Southwest Virginia is like and explain where it is. If somebody says, I'm from Roanoke, I'm from Southwest Virginia, and you go down and turn your water on at the Scott County Water Department, as I did one time, because I had been staying with some people in Roanoke. These ladies looked at me and they said, Honey, Roanoke is not Southwest Virginia. Scott County is right here. Roanoke is way over here. The other side of Virginia Tech, which is the other side of the world to the people in Scott County. The funny thing about Route 58 when it gets to Abingdon, it goes up and over and stretches and comes back down the part I didn't show you, and it comes back down here to Pennington Gap. And it's so confusing because here's the other 58, I don't have it on this map either, but it's going down here and kind of comes up 23 and goes on and they join together again. And what's so dumb, and I only can call it as dumb, is that it doesn't always say US 58A. So if somebody says, hey, I'm on 58 in Castlewood, well, that's 58A. Why they had to use the same number, I don't know. But that's one of the confusing parts of being in Southwest Virginia. 
But what is Southwest Virginia? Where is it? 17 counties, and this is the area of the state. The reason Patrick County, Roanoke County, and even Craig County is not Southwest Virginia is because the rest of those counties, those 17 counties where the water flows to the west to the Gulf of Mexico, the rest of it is coming over this way, over to the bay, or it's going down into the Roanoke River, over to the Atlantic Ocean. You go on top, if you're on Highway 58A, and you're just west of Abingdon, you can come up here to Hidden Valley Lake, which is 3,600 feet up in the air. It's kind of a straight up shot on a mountain, uh, but it's a beautiful little 61 acre mountaintop lake. You go into Norton, you'll pass by the High Knob Tower, which was replaced the last couple of years by a gentleman uh, got together with some others and raised some funds because an arsonist had burned down the original wooden tower in 2007 on Halloween night. Uh, but the people, the good people of Wise County got together and built this beautiful uh, stone structure. And as one of the forest officials said, I just want to make sure we burn, we build something that doesn't burn. When you come back down into Norton in a little town called Josephine, you'll come to the country cabin. And there is a ghost story associated with that. In my Haunts of Virginia's Blue Ridge Highlands book, one of my earlier ghost tale books, I also talk about the ghost of the lady that started the country cabin and how she came back from the afterlife to look at one of the shows. This is another spot on the Crooked Road, Virginia's Heritage Music Trail. This is the McCoy Falls up on the New River. And this is a popular spot for tubing for Virginia Tech and Radford University students one of the many waterfalls that we have in the area. This is one that you have to hike a little bit to get into, about a mile down, a mile back. It's kind of an easy hike. But this is the Big Falls in Russell County, Virginia, the Pinnacle Natural Area Preserve. And I was there on New Year's Day of this year. And this is another one. This is actually a mill dam, but this is in Burke's Garden, Virginia. Burke's Garden got its name from a man named James Burke. He spelled his name B-U-R-K. People later added an E onto it. So this is a bowl on top of a mountain, garden mountain, and it sank down and formed this hidden valley, very fertile land. They said that you can grow things in Burke's garden you're not even trying to grow. But what about James Burke? How'd he get its name? James Burke was a hunter. So legendary, he killed so many bears on one creek that it ran greasy with blood. It became known as Greasy Creek and he carried potatoes with him everywhere. And he dropped his potatoes in one creek, it became known as Potato Creek. He started out, he was started out chasing down this elk over in Grayson County. And he found it on Elk Creek, okay? He got a good stab at it and he crippled it on what became known as Cripple Creek. He finally ran on into this, into the, over this uh, garden mountain and came down to this valley and he said, behold, I have found the Garden of Eden. Now these explorers later figured out exactly where James Burke was the next year because they got out just beyond this pond into the center of the valley and they found these potatoes growing. And they jokingly referred to this as Burke's Garden, Burke's Potato Garden, and that's how it got its name. So it is now known as God's Thumbprint or Garden Spot of the World. Probably just over the mountain there from Burke's Garden and just down to, uh, down a little bit, uh, into Smith County and on the Washington County border, what is probably the epicenter and um, the geographical center of Southwest Virginia, Saltville, Virginia. So this is kind of at the center of that whole area between what is Virginia Tech, Floyd County, Hillsville, on out to the Cumberland Gap. This town is sort of sitting right in the center of everything, known as the salt capital of the Confederacy. What they would do is they would dig salt uh, deposits up and, and brine and they would boil it in these kettles there. And as they were doing that, they were able to produce salt and this was used by the Confederacy to uh, preserve meat. And this became known as the Salt Capital of the Confederacy because there were two battles there in 1864. And um, they, today they have Civil War battles, and one about 10 or 12 years ago that I wrote about in Haunted Highlands. Well, when they were done, all the guys started saying, boy, we really had some 
authentic people out there. And there were some African Americans that had fought on the field. And they said, boy, that guy over there, he was the best one on the field. And then they all compared their notes and said, we don't have any African Americans out here on the field. Then they started looking at their photographs and they found ghostly images in the smoke of other soldiers that weren't actually on the field. It was so misty, they said, it just seemed like a real battle was taking place during that reenactment. Just down the road, Abijah Thomas had his octagon house built. He died inside this house. And today they say if you go inside one particular room, some people say there are stains on the floor that are from food jars. And some say this is where the slaves were brought into the house, tied up and punished, and this is blood on the floor. Down the road from that in Withful is the Log House restaurant. The Log House restaurant has been standing, according to some speculation and historians, since 1776 along the Great Stage Road in Withville, Virginia. At least part of the cabin at the center goes back to that date. The historians have verified 1784 uh, for sure, but at one time there's many stories about how a shadow showed up in, in, when this was carved into apartments in the early 1900s and they looked into a mirror and it looked as if they saw the shadow of a man who had hanged himself in one of the apartments. St. Albans is up in Radford, Virginia. This is also in the Haunted Highlands book. St. Albans was an old mental hospital, and today they lead ghostly tours inside this place. When you look at those stairs, they're the stairs of your nightmares. And when you go in there, you'll hear about all kinds of strange and weird creatures, including one phantom that runs around the place and hangs out in the bowling alley with his piercing red eyes. Telephones that ring and nobody's there. Sometimes they hear voices. And sometimes there was a lady, a school teacher. She said she, all of a sudden, she was standing all by herself and she heard a man's voice come up to her ear and he said, hey. She didn't know what to do, so she said, hey, back. It freaked her out and she has no explanation for any of it. I wanna wrap up tonight with one more trip into North Carolina. One of my favorite stories in Haunted Highlands it's about a little girl named Emily. Now, Emily, over at Tate Hall at the campus of Lees McRae College in Banner Elk, Emily, according to the campus legend, and I'm gonna leave out a couple of details as a surprise and a mystery. According to the campus legend, little Emily was a girl who died when Tate Hall was a hospital. And she's buried outside, Emily Drawn, at a tombstone that said, she is not dead, but sleeping. Now, it is believed that when she was over here at the Tate Hall, that she has come back into this building that was built in 1932, and that she not only goes around Tate Hall, she goes around other parts of the campus. People say, when you tell these ghost tales, where are you getting these from? Do you talk to every nut that comes up to you and says, hey, I saw a ghost? Well, now, sometimes I'll talk to just about everybody, but I, I always like to find people that I think are really verifiable. People that I've known perhaps in another situation. Talia Freeman. Talia Freeman was a server at a very elite restaurant at Beach Mountain. It's when I first met her about 10 years ago. And then she's in marketing over at Ski Beach, at Beach Mountain at the ski resort on top of the mountain. So I'd already known her in a professional situation, written her in several different articles. And I said, Talia, did you went to Lee's McRae? She says, yes, I did. Very upstanding young lady. And she said, you know, Joe, I was so petrified my freshman year, I slept with a Bible under my bed. I said, you, I just had this weird feeling all the time. I just had this feeling that there was a presence or something. Her phone would ring and there was nobody there. Sometimes she'd put the shower head and the water over here and then she'd kind of get back and if she was pointing over there and nobody was there. Sometimes she and her friends would take a ball 
and they lived in Tate Hall, and they would put it outside their dorm room, and all of a sudden, boom, 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 that ball would be bouncing all by itself. They'd run out, and there was nobody there. I believe in her, said Sherry Johnson, the librarian at Lee's McRae. I think she is here. I think Emily is here on campus. The girl is Emily Drawn, is said to inhabit portions of the James H. Carson Library, especially the Sterling Collection, housed on an upper floor. It is here said, Johnson, that Emily's spirits may be drawn to the collection's rare books on the Appalachian Mountains. She's heard movement and stuff upstairs, the door shuddering, and Miss Johnson said, we knew there was nobody up there, and we have claims of books being pushed off the shelves. Reportedly one time, a security guard was once called up to the library Sterling collection as the lights would turn themselves on time after time. They'd come on, he'd turn them off. They'd come on, he'd turn them off. They'd come on, he'd turn them off. Finally fed up, the guard said, Emily, I'm tired. Please go to bed. <laughs> and after that, the light stayed off and the library was dark for the rest of the night. Thank you very much for listening to me this evening. I appreciate everyone coming out.